Welcome back to Global Studies with Ms. Pritchard. This video is for Global 2 students and it is going to cover European nationalism and the arts. So this is Italy, Germany, and Romanticism to Impressionism. And all of this occurs during the 19th century in Europe. Alright, in the 19th century, there are three different types of nationalist movements. First, you have unification. That is where you have kingdoms or areas with a common culture and language that unite to form a country. The best examples of this are Italy and Germany. And then you also have the separation movements. This is where cultural groups break away from an empire. One of the best examples of this is the Greeks in the Ottoman Empire. And then you have state building. That is where different cultural groups adopt a single culture and unite to form a country. This is how the United States was formed, and this is also how many of the countries in South America or Latin America are formed. The Austrian Empire. Now, the Austrian Empire had a long history. You might remember during the French Revolution, it, Marie Antoinette was an Austrian princess, and her mother became the Empress of Austria after a long, drawn-out war to determine whether or not a woman could lead an empire. So, the Austrian Empire became the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but then national movements continue and it weakens the empire throughout the 19th century. And the Austrian Empire included Slovenes, Hungarians, Germans, Czechs, Slovaks, Croats, Poles, Serbs, and Italians. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire is dissolved after World War I. The Russian Empire. The Tsars continue to rule over a weak, feudal empire that cannot maintain the absolute control, and it ends up falling apart during World War I. Now, the Russian Empire included Russians, Ukrainians, Poles, Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, Finns, Jews, Romanians, Georgians, Armenians, Turks, and many other groups. Now, the Russification that was enforced by Alexander III makes the problem worse by forcing the people to give up their own ethnicity and their own national culture actually just reinforces the idea of nationalism. The Ottoman Empire. The Turks rule the last powerful Muslim empire and they continue to weaken throughout the 19th century just like the other two empires. Now, the Ottoman Empire included Greeks, Slavs, Arabs, Bulgarians, and Armenians, as well as the Turks. In 1856, all citizens were given equal status in the empire, and that had to do with a lot of pressure from European nations. It, however, angered the conservative Turks, who liked the fact that the Turks were the most important and the highest status people in the empire. And once again, the Ottoman Empire is dissolved after World War I. It no longer exists. Italian unification. Camillo di Cavour, he was the prime minister of Sardinia, and he wanted to unite Italy and, in effect, make Sardinia more powerful. He starts a war with Austria and wins that war with the help of France. In southern Italy, you have Giuseppe Garibaldi and the Red Shirts, who are uniting southern Italy, and Count Cavour manages to convince Garibaldi to support King Victor Emmanuel II of Sardinia as the leader of a united Italy by 1870. German unification is led by Otto von Bismarck. He is the Prime Minister of Prussia, and he wants to unite all German people into one powerful nation, and he uses a term called real politic, or any means necessary to achieve his goal. And that should sound very similar because we had Machiavelli and the Prince, who also encouraged the same thing, and that was back during the Renaissance in Italy. 
So, much like Italian unification, Bismarck starts several wars to help unite the Germans. He fights wars against Denmark, Austria, and France to gain territory. And eventually, it's Kaiser Wilhelm I who rules over a united Germany by 1871. All right, the balance of power. The new nations changed the balance of power that was established at the Congress of Vienna, so their agreements no longer hold. Britain and Germany have the most powerful militaries and the strongest economies, and I would like to point out that has lasted to this day. Britain and Germany are still the most powerful militaries and economies in Europe. Austria and Russia, however, are falling farther and farther behind all of the other countries, and France is kind of caught in the middle of all of it. All right, during this time period, you also get a lot of changes in the arts. One of the movements is Romanticism, and that is the focus on emotion, and you can see that in poetry, music, and painting. You also have the flip side of that, which is realism, and that is focusing on showing the reality, and the development of photography really, really helps with that. But this is where, instead of making all of your pictures look pretty and nice, you actually want to show the grit and the grime and the, the negative side of things as well. And then you have impressionism, and that is a focus on mood and lighting and painting, and Van Gogh is probably the most famous Impressionist. And with those images, they are better viewed from farther away because they are going for the idea of the image instead of recreating the image. Um, for example, the lily pond that Van Gogh is famous for painting. From far away, you can look at it and say, oh yes, that's definitely a lily pond. But up close, it just looks like a whole bunch of dots. You might want to Google it and see some of the images for yourself. All right, and people begin to have time and money to invest in entertainment again, which leads to an increase in the arts. And it is from this time period that we are going to get our popular music and movies start and basically, the entertainment we look at today was all starting to develop in the late 19th century. All right, make sure your notes are in your notebook and that you show them to me for credit.